Welcome back to Icons, and today I am honored to be joined by one of your favorites, the voice of Gohan in Dragon Ball Z and Kid Goku in Dragon Ball and GT, among many other voices in many other shows, but this is the one many of you grew up with, so please welcome to Geekdom 101. You asked for it and you got it. Stephanie Nadolny, how are you? Hey, I'm doing great here in the Dallas, Dallas Fort Worth, Texas area. Ready to rock. Yes, I'm very happy to have you on. And here's a bit of trivia here uh, for many people who might not know this, including yourself. I don't know if you even realize this, but you are the first English-speaking actress who has voiced both Goku and Gohan. Because most English dubs have two separate actresses voicing Goku and Gohan. But you're the first one to actually do both. And you did a combined something like four, like almost 400 episodes. Yeah, that's a lot of work. That sounds like a lot, yeah. <laughs> but it just, did it just breeze by when you were there, though? Like, like you know, or was it like a long time? Oh, man. Well, you know, as you get older, things just blow by so much faster. But no, I remember it. I was very well aware of what was going on, and I was happy to have different things to do in between whenever the episodes, you know, were kind of slowing down as far as my role and my line count. But yeah, no, it was a great time. It was a great run. I love it. I miss it a lot. Well, before we go back, I wanted to first ask, how have you been and what projects are you currently working on right now? Like what, because I know you were telling me that you had some things lined up, but what's going on with your career? Like what, you're not retired, right? That's one thing we got to lay out. No, you no. are not done. You, you I'm still got years. I'm not going to retire until I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> all right, fair enough. I mean it, right? Right. And I mean, thankfully, I mean, I'm a, well, first of all, I'm a singer. I started out singing and acting and was a little bitty girl before I even knew that there was a career to be made in that. But um, yeah, no, I'm good. I'm good. It's been a tough year for everybody. We've got this uh, pandemic. Anybody in show business with voice acting, live performance, per, you know, performing with my band, things like that, I've all been had to basically be put on hold. Aside from some really awesome recent um, convention appearances with social distancing, obviously. So, yeah, no, now re basically what I'm doing is I'm kind of rebuilding my life, my personal life. And I'm um, uh, I'm an advocate for bullying and addiction and different things like that that people might, might be going through. I have a story there. And I'm also doing some um, virtual and online as well as in-person convention appearances um, in and out of Texas, Louisiana. I did one recently. Well, I say recently, a couple of years ago, in Minneapolis. So I'm definitely getting back out in front of the fans. Uh, as long as it's safe to do so. And then my most recent work I've been doing is um, I'm a narrator. I'm one of three narrators for Wonderbot Animals, which is featured on YouTube. It's great cool. because, personally, I love animals, and I'm getting to use my voice, just my regular voice, to narrate these amazing stories about anything from elephants to bears, cats, dogs, sharks, fish, really cool stuff, feel-good stuff, usually about five to seven minutes long, and that's kind of what I've been doing regularly. I do between 10 and 13 scripts a week, and then I've got some ins and outs with radio, and I'm doing some radio spots for Salem Communications for various things, and then I'm also just out and about uh, sniffing around what the next project might be for voiceover with different companies and projects. Right. Well, uh, I look forward to talking about all that stuff with you, uh, you know, the past, present. Before we go, well, actually, let's go back. So, okay, you are not from Texas. You are from Memphis, Tennessee. Is that correct? I was born in Memphis, Tennessee, way, way, way back in the day. Wow. Back in the Elvis Presley times. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. And so... In the 70s, in the 70s, yeah. What, now, is that why you had aspirations to be a singer. Like, is that, was being a singer your dream gig when you were a kid? You know, it was, I think it was regardless of where I was raised. I came from a family um, enriched with all kinds of music. My father liked disco and some classic rock, some Beatles and some nostalgic stuff. And my mom liked Neil Diamond, Barbara Streisand, um, and then when my stepdad came along, that introduced me to some uh, some country music, Olivia Newton-John, um, Charlie Rich. Um, you know, I just had records from, and gosh, you know, we go way back to 8-track. I hate to age myself, but 8-track tapes were the thing way back. And I remember right. dad, well, both my parents, as when I was very, very young, as far back as I can remember, we always had a really cool stereo. We had like the old fashioned like cabinet stereo. And my dad would put like seven, uh, uh, eight track 
tapes in and record us like singing and I'm talking three years old. I don't know how I remember back that far. I, I don't know if it's because I just have this crazy and same memory right uh, which is why i think i love elephants so much they have such good memories right no Me that's too. kind of but yeah no so like the biggest part of my life was music um dancing to the music learning it just really it just became part of who i was and you know i had so many influences from my father with disco and classic rock and my mother and it was just it was we were just immersed in music 50s and 60s nostalgia and then I started singing, I think, really about the time I learned how to talk and I was dancing about the time I could walk. And anything that was like show business, I knew in the heart of hearts, even as a young child, that's what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to either be a singer or uh, anything that involved a voice and right. performing. Uh, Behind a microphone. Yeah, absolutely. And I remember my dad would be like, OK, it's bedtime. I was three and he would hold a little microphone way back in the day and he said, we have to turn it off now. And I would hold it and go, no, don't hold it, daddy. And I didn't want to let go of it because I was just in heaven. And I had the, you know, whole, I had to put on the show on the uh, fireplace with the hairbrush microphone and <laughs> all wow. that stuff. Were you, were, so you I were, you, were you a big hit for the karaoke scene? Oh, I did. Yeah. Later on. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I mean at the time then the karaoke didn't even exist, but yeah, no, I, I was just like, let's put on a show. I wanted to go to California. I wanted to be in Cal you know, uh, radio. I wanted to be in commercials. Family was like, no, no, no. We want to raise you like a normal kid. You don't need to be doing that, you know. And I, I begged. I begged, please take me to California. Please take me to New York. Please, I want to be in commercials. I want to be a singer. I want to, you know, be a pop star. I want to record in studios and have an album. And none of us like, no, no, no. Because it's all about, you know survival and my stepdad you know getting transferred and stuff so uh, that's what i wanted to do and i was able to do that once i broke out of high school and into college years well that's what i want to ask you about because i have a couple of names here from your past now i did a little bit of research but i don't have details on this so i'm have to have you fill me in tell me about lindy and the look and vince vance and the valiance oh yeah that's a great that's here we are that's right about where i was where i left off right um you know, I moved around a lot, so everywhere I went, I wanted to be involved in choir, drill team, pom-pom, acting, theater, whatever. With anything that involved expressing yourself through theater, singing, and all that kind of stuff with the right. voice. Right. Um, right as I got out of high school, I ended up in the North Texas area from 1988 on. My stepdad was transferred again. And then, we, you know, I've been... So I've stayed put since then. I, I moved enough my whole life. I was like, nope, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> and I've been in the same house for literally 20 years now. Um, I joined a band in, well, I think I was 18. And I had just started college. And there was this little side band, up and coming group that wanted to put together something, start doing some gigs. And, and so I, I rehearsed with them regularly a couple times a week. Did some stuff in the studio, put together a demo. And then one of the neighbors who overheard my voice literally from across the street through the open window huh. said, Hey, you know, we, I'm Lindy. My name is Lindy Wilson. And it's Lindy. The look, we're looking for singers. We want to have, you know, three or four girls to, you know, wear costumes and come and travel with us and be a singer. And so I auditioned for them and then boom, all of a sudden Ed Cobb, who was the manager of that band was like, Hey, she might work out to be a really good value for Vince Vance and the Valiants featuring the vivacious fix in the rock and roll, the value which I knew nothing of. But I went straight from that audition within a week to an audition for Vince Vance and the Valiants, who has this amazing Christmas song, All I Want for Christmas Is You, that was re released in 89. Right. And in 91, they put me on the road, and I was just this green, young singer, 18, 90 years old. Oh, my gosh, what am I doing? Of course, I loved it. And then I joined that band and was with them for off and on for a couple of decades. And you, then uh, You got to fulfill your dream, basically. I did, and you know what? I thought I was very scholastic, and I thought, no, I'm going to go to school, I'm going to go to college, I'm going to get straight A's, whatever. That's what I wanted to do. And being in small towns for moving around, um, that's kind of what everybody around me was doing. They were, you know, they like went through school, went to college, they got married, had babies, and everything was kind of, that's kind of what they did. But with me, you know, being transplanted down to North Texas, everything kind of changed, and... Um, 
I wasn't in as much of a rush to do any of that of those things. I wanted to pursue my career. So that's what I did. And fortunately, it worked out. Um, it was hard being in bands with a couple other girls. It was always kind of like this catty bullying kind of thing or, you know, we were young and, I, you know, everybody wanted to sing and be featured and all that stuff. But I went through all that and had been through it before. And I was just really happy for the opportunity. Vince Vance, The Valiants, I mean, I cut my teeth in show business, showmanship, anything that involved live performance, studio performance, cutting, you know, tracks for, for albums came from Vince Vance and The Valiants. And coincidentally, I'm literally like almost the same age as the band. The band just celebrated their 49th anniversary this year. So next year's the big 50. Let's hope Vince Vance that makes it, you know, it's so, been a long, long road. Are you going to go sing with them again? Like for the anniversary? Or I mean, will they? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, great, yeah. great, great. Well, anytime he can use me and I'm available, we, we rock. You know, I help him find girls. I became a mentor, worked with the costuming, the choreography, had a big, big hand in all of that. Um, it was really, I didn't want to leave. I just, I mean, even though it was tough sometimes, long tours, a little bit of craziness with the, the chick singer drama, but I got through it because I loved it so much. And then I learned a lot too, and I was able to, be kind of like a big sister to mentoring other valiant valionettes that I was able to recruit along the way. How hard was it being on the road? You know, because uh, I feel like that's a grind. I don't think people understand how difficult it is to be on the road all the time. Yes, and it was a time when it was like I don't know. The days just seemed to go slow, and you know you can't really get away from your peeps, and you don't necessarily want to, but you kind of want to have your space. And that was that was very difficult because we were all together you know, good, solid eight or nine people, you know, whether it be, we had the three valionettes, we had the whole band, um, we added a saxophone at some point, and there's just a lot of us on the road taking care of each other, eating together, sharing rooms together, traveling all over the United States, some parts of Canada and Europe. So, but it, it was a really good, just raw experience for someone who came from such a straight-laced, extremely strict background with a a uh, stepfather from the military and, you know, right and wrong was, you know, you were in trouble if you did anything wrong and the punishment was like very strict and right. crazy and then moving around from small town to small town. That was hard. But being on the road, I learned a whole different side of life, you know, learning how to like fend for yourself, make good decisions. Um, yeah. Manage your own money. I had an, I had a bank account you know, a credit card for the first time. It was, and you were lot. mad young too. Like I was 18, almost right. 19 when I joined. Absolutely. It was a long time ago. And Barely an adult. Yeah. And then especially coming from such a straight laced environment with my stepdad and everything was very, very, very conservative. And I couldn't even see rated R movies. I couldn't see PG movies. Like it was very, very, a very strict household for me. And I mean, I was, I mean, I can see it now looking back that that was a good thing, but like being able to tear down those walls and not be so, you know, straight laced about everything and just like be relaxed and down to earth, you know, all that kind of came with traveling in a show band and learning from people that were older than me and listening to their advice and watching them and learning from, from what they did. Is there one piece of advice that you got during those years that carried into your voice career and maybe even... Uh, carried into your personal life, like as far as you as a person, even to this day, is there something you remember that sticks out to you? In general, I think it's, um, you know, I, I had an older brother and then when he hit 13 and I was probably not even quite 10, he moved in with my dad in Colorado and the family was divided and there was this, you know, crazy time of trying to get along with stepbrothers and step families and mixed families and things like that. But then being thrown out on the road at such a young age, um, I learned from, well, being like the kid sister of everybody and then like really learning from them and learning how to take care of multiple people, not just a brother or a sister, but like a family and um, right. making sure that, you know, if they give us a free meal or they give us a free t-shirt, I made sure, you know, you know what? we don't want this unless there's going to be enough for everybody kind of thing. So I learned how to kind of take care of this extended family of mine. Who I still, some of my, most of them I still keep in touch with today. You know, we're talking about what, 2020, you know, we're talking about what, 30 plus years right? or 25 plus years. And it's, 
and then being involved in the 20th, the 25th, the 30th, the 35th and the 40th plus reunions, you know, and feeling like I'm really part of something and not having to be ripped from town to town. Yeah, I was traveling, but like I was part of something and I was able to, to um, develop some roots with some people I trusted that kind of became my family, even if it was good up, down, back, you know, man, you might get a little tiff here and there, but it's like you learn from it. And you just learn to take care of your peeps. And I'm, I'm like that now more than ever. Like, I want to take care of my peeps, my anime fans, my fans of my work, whatever. Like, they're my people, you know? How'd you end up in Texas? My stepdad was transferred. Uh, it was, uh, let's see, I moved, I can't even count. I think 16, 17 times from age 3 to 16. That's got to be hard. I don't even, gosh, it seems like it was every year. But it, every once in a while I stayed a, a couple of years, I ended up in, let's see, Me so you started in Memphis, Houston, Texas, Spring, Texas. Then it was uh, Durant, Oklahoma, 8th through 11th, oh, 5th through 8th grade. Then Coffeyville, Kansas, 8th through 11th grade. Then back to Louisville, which is North Dallas, in uh, 11th grade, the end of 11th grade. So that was hard. My senior year was crazy hard. I cried all the time. Everybody's like, well, she just cries. You know, she misses her peeps. And I, yeah, and she's like, yeah, she you, cries. You so had to does. make new friends every time you moved. I, and, and well, right. That's the thing is like the first year or year and a half, you know, they don't want anything to, anything to do with you. Either that or they embrace you like crazy. Like if you're really good at something, like, you know, I wasn't really great at like sports. I mean, I could do some like track stuff, but like I was a singer, dancer, actress. I was a performer. And so like, that was like a, a double-edged sword because, it was good and I can entertain. Everything was great. But like there was a lot of jealousy and like bullying being that it was a small town. And so when you have a new girl or a new guy, that was like the big talk of the whole year, you know, right. such small towns. But now I look at it and I go back and I'm like, I, you can put me anywhere and I can just, you know, adapt. You're like a chameleon. A chameleon. Yeah. Right. So it's great now. At the time it was horrendous and I didn't want to leave and I have all these attachment issues that I'm having to deal with now as an adult, like missing all my friends. But then Facebook came along and I'm like, yes. And then I got a hold of everybody again. And there's the 10 year reunion and the 20 year reunion and you get to go back and see everybody. And I just didn't want to miss any of that. So I definitely have attachment issues, but I'm trying to use them for good. And, um, right. Yeah. So that's kind of what happened. I just, I just got ripped and transplanted and it seemed like it was never a good time. It was never like summer. It was always like, February or March or December. And so that made it even harder because you're just uprooted in the middle of what you thought would be the plan for your life, you know? I have attachment issues as well. And I actually just discovered mine this year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought I was married young, had babies, and be all these things, and go to this college in Kansas. And, you know, everything changes when you get ripped up and moved away. Right, right, right. I mean, but attachment issues can be from like your parents and. You know, people out there who were adopted might have attachment issues, and but it does affect you later in life. And being somebody like you who were moved around a lot, it was almost like it was almost like abandonment issues times uh, times ten. Because every time that you yeah. would move, you would lose your friends. I can't even imagine. All the roots were gone. All the roots were gone, and then I had yeah. to like yeah. feel this pressure to like um, prove myself or. Right. It's not like I was showing off by any means. I mean, it's just like, hey, I like to sing and dance and whatever. Mm -hmm. And I knew I wasn't going to get to go back to where I was, which I, as much as I wanted to. So I had to just make these roots and plant my feet down and do what I wanted to do just to get through it because it was so hard, you know. And in, there's just bullying at all ages. I mean, I've even gotten bullied in my 40s now. <laughs> the industry, I mean, it's everywhere. I mean, it's it's just a matter of just doing the best you can trying to be the best person you can and try to help those around you and just not let the negativity take hold of you. And then I think that you learn from it and you just want to do good things. Yeah. The entertainment industry, whether it be anything from doing voice to being an A-list actor, uh, there's going to be a sense of bullying and, and, and things like that. Or at least even if you're not in intentionally being bullied, you're going to yeah. have the feeling that you're being bullied because if you get overlooked and, it's mm -hmm. it's just a thing. Now I want to. Talk and they're about, like, you never lived there. You never. You didn't live here long enough to make your yeah. make your voice heard. And it's like, well, it wasn't my choice. I mean, I got ripped from school to school. But people are like, well, you can't be, you know, the captain of the prom prom, or you can't be the show choir captain because you haven't been here long enough. And then you have to just like reestablish your roots and work your way up again. It, it was just a constant battle. So 
it's kind of funny and ironic that I'm in the industry where I have to do that all the time. I have to reestablish and prove myself, you know? I didn't mean to interrupt you, by the way. No, just, no, it's... It's, it's just a reflection. It's kind of a reflection as an adult looking back and not moving around anymore to see how it has influenced my life today. So you're happy where you're at right now? Are you, You're in Dallas still? I'm in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, yes. Okay. And I have not moved. It's funny because I moved so much. <laughs> right. 20 years ago, I lost my mom and I bought a house and I started my whole life over and I have not moved since. It's crazy. I'm I about want... to ready to move next year, but not out of the area by any means. I want to ask you about the mom thing in just a moment, but first I wanted to bring up uh, career-wise. So Gohan was the first voice that you had done for animation, correct? Uh, yes, I did do the voice of Helen the Hen with Chuck E. Cheese for a very brief moment, mostly the singing voice, and which is coincidentally how I met Barry Watson, who was um, the director of the english dub in canada before he moved everything down to yep. the north fort worth area where i was able to audition for whatever roles which i thought would be female <laughs> turned out they wanted me to audition for young boys <laughs> which is crazy i had no idea i didn't even like rehearse for that but. that was what i was going to ask you so you came in okay so just the you know, funimation changed direction instead of, of outsourcing to ocean they came down in-house to texas and now so did you get discovered did you audition so were you already yeah. doing Chuck E. cheese and then they said hey we've got this dragon ball z show we need new actors and then you came in for that is that how it worked not exactly i, I had done some of that um Chuck E. cheese stuff separately but which is for Funimation. <laughs> Well, actually, that was for, no, it was a different company. Oh, okay. And it was, yeah, it was for Chuck E. Cheese, the pizza parlor place for kids, entertainment, right. and right. games. But what the, the, the person that was the glue between that project and Funimation was Carl Finch from Brave Combo, which is a nuclear polka band out of Denton, Texas. They've been around many, many years, well over 40 years now. Um, at the time, uh, they actually brought me on board to be a vocalist but through Vince Vance and the Valiants because Vince Vance and the Valiants either opened for or was an adjoining show band that worked at similar venues in the North Texas area. It whether all it be, ties in. Yeah, we had like, you know, German Fest and we had like the State Fair and we were kind of in the same realm of like booking and so they would open for us or we'd open for them. And then once I met some of the the peeps from Brave Combo would sit in and kind of hang out with them. And I met Carl Finch and he asked me to sing some backup vocals for Cyborgs, which was a Funimation project right. going on at the time. 1998, long before they decided to move Dragon Ball Z down, which happened soon after. And then at that particular session in the studio in Denton, I was singing like this background, like Battlestar Galactica stuff. It's like this really cool, like... right extraterrestrial sound uh, the, the, sci-fi the, the, the pre-anime Funimation was right. weird they were very weird they had the Morris Brothers that's why I asked about Chuck E. Cheese the geek guys with the glasses yeah and, yeah that yeah. era was strange it's almost like they want to forget that even existed it was just way back in the day like I said before I say back in the day or back in the day I sound like an old lady but no that's when I met Barry and then when we talked about it and he kind of heard me sing he said, do you do voices? And I said, well, you know, I've been doing voices since I was a little kid just for fun. I mean, my little cassette player. And I had my own little, you know, question and answers, little radio shows that I made up. But I didn't have anything. I didn't know I had anything to do with my career at all. And then he said, well, here's my card, whatever. And then he remembered me. I gave him my card. It's kind of an industry thing, you know. And then when he brought the show down to do auditions, I guess he got together with Funimation Local being North Fort Worth. And it's like, hey, let's do auditions. And then I was called in to audition kind of by who I knew through that experience, which is like, I was so glad for that. And then when I came in, I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, I'd been reading for the female Chi Chi, Poir, Bulma, you know, some of the characters, which I didn't even Poir know. Poir is supposed to be male. That's interesting. It's a really high voice, though. I know it is. <laughs> and you nailed it right there. So, yeah. Oh, well, this being a mimic, I don't know. But I remember showing up not knowing this was a long time ago you know this right. is like simpsons and yeah you know you you didn't even know anything about dragon ball i'm guessing 
No, and I didn't know anything about Japanese anime either. Right. We're talking 98. This is late 98, 1998. And I remember coming in fully prepared to, re you know, read for these female characters. And they're like, no, no, no. Okay, that's good. That's whatever. Okay, that's great. Now try this. And then they would say, sound like a little boy. Okay. Uh, what would a little boy sound like? And they're like, then they kind of directed me like, okay, up high, low, add a little rasp. And for whatever reason, they were impressed with that and cast me as Kid Gohan around episode 54 for the you know, around the Ginyu saga in Dragon Ball Z. Right. That's the and one. Remember, they didn't give me a reference. They didn't want me to mimic anything. They didn't know anything about it. They wanted to cast this from the ground up and just be like, this is the new voices. So wait, they were the ones that told you to add the rasp? They did. They did. I, I, I came up with whatever. I know. I, I was like, okay, little boy, little boy, what would I do? Thankfully, I had all these voices in my arsenal from growing up and playing around with the, you know, the uh, the uh, cassette player stuff with my friends, and we would have our own little radio shows, and you know, I'd learn from what I'd heard and mimicking this and that, and yeah, and so it, I ended up getting cast as Kid Gohan, and I got the phone call. This is way back, so I had like a answering machine yeah. we didn't have cell phone well we started to like a year or so but after they were that. big and ugly <laughs> yeah inside a big giant nokia's but yeah no so yeah and then i'm like oh i was just so excited to be involved in something unique like that and honestly i thought the singing and whatever i was doing with my vocals was going to kind of put me on the map but overall in general with my career the voice acting has definitely been more prominent whether it be through wikipedia imdb and different things i've been cast it's, it's been the voice acting, way more than the, the singing. I guess a lot of more people can sing in general, but not all singers can voice act, maybe, or come up with these character voices. I mean, you got to play, you know, Gohan and Kid Goku are literally international iconic characters. You know, in many ways, you're only a handful of people have played Goku. I think I counted uh, for just English, there, including adult Goku, there's only 16 people in the whole world. Which is well, not in the whole world, in the English speaking world, but there's there's also the Romans and you know the Italian dubs. Everybody's got, but you know it's not that many. It's maybe fifty, uh, maybe sixty. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, and, and yeah, and it's it's not there's not a lot of it's a big character. So um, what I was going to ask you was the so when you did the little boy voice, that's when they said you're Gohan, but. You uh -huh. said you were not told to mimic Saffron Henderson, which is interesting because Sabbat was mimicking Brian Drummond and Schemmel was sort of mimicking Peter Kalamis. They were all kind of told to mimic, but the two yeah. voices that did not mimic were not just you, but also Sonny Strait's Krillin did not sound like Terry Clayson. Why did they have you do your own take and not copy Saffron Henderson? That's not kind of interesting. Right. Well, I didn't even know really what the answer was, at least not then. But as time has gone by, I think they just wanted to make sure that whoever they brought on board was going to just like this was going to be like a like a sounding board for this new take on the voice of these characters. And with me in, per in particular, I remember being like, what is this? Like, what? Who is this? And I remember they showed me a picture once I was cast. So then I could kind of identify with, oh, okay, that's about how old he is. That's what he looks like. And then it was like, we just kind of went from there. But then whenever I was voicing for a while, and once I had that reference, when I'd come back and I knew exactly where I was kind of going with the voice, I remember going, well, who did this voice before? And I remember doing some re research, and I found Saffron Henderson. Yes, and I was you like, contacted oh, her. This is so cool. And, you know, I was like, I wanted to be friends with her and be in touch with her and ask her what her – you know, what her experience was like, and we got to be friends, and our friends on Facebook and stuff, and, so, and then I found out she was a singer, and I'm like, oh my gosh, we have all this stuff in common, we just, right. she's in Canada, and I'm in the U.S., and so I just thought it was neat, but I think they just really wanted to, to well, at least for me, I, I don't know about all the characters, but they wanted something unique, and something that uh, me as a voice actor could come up with based on the direction, and not necessarily mimic or sound like anybody else. I mean, you. And then what was cool is we finished the saga, came back and did one through fifty four, and then we ended up doing the whole saga with the same voice actors, which was kind of cool. So right, the uh, the the ultimate uncut editions, the 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 first two seasons, basically. Right, and then they picked up the Dragon Ball um, property at some point. I'm not sure exactly when, but it was like uh, two or three years in, and I remember they. They kind of just sort of gave me the role, but they also... I was going to ask you about that, actually. Yeah, they were going to be quick to take it back if I didn't 
come up with what they wanted to hear, which is which is fine. Um, it ended up working out being that they're related, and that's like you know, Gohan's father is a kid. I just took away the rasp and changed the delivery based on the acting part of it, kind of like the situational stuff and like how he responded and and being so young and innocent, not and fearless. Right. <laughs> and it became so fun for me personally because I personally love like comedy, love comedy, love the whole little kid Goku dropping his pants, peeing in the river, grabbing his fish, putting it over his shoulder, <laughs> taking it home to eat, grabbing <laughs> women, grabbing women's crotches without their permission. Kicking. Looking for Dragon Balls that right. aren't there. Right. Exactly. Just, I, you know, it's so cute and funny. And him not knowing the difference when Master Roshi is like, bring me this kind of a girl, you know. Oh, like, I remember I, that. The mermaid. You don't know the difference, right? They're all pretty to him. They're just pretty girls. <laughs> Very innocent, yeah. So and I love that because I'm a comedic person. I love to laugh. love to make people laugh. So that, that I mean, I love voice and kid gohan absolutely especially through the super saiyan saga with cell saga well, but i definitely can relate and embrace both characters i've got i've got questions about that but i wanted to ask you just real quick before we get to goku about gohan so what did you eclipsed saffron because saffron had only done the 53 episodes and then came back to do the canadian uh, a b group dub or whatever if that's what they call it i forget what's called um not the A B group. I'm being an idiot. The uh, the ocean, the second ocean run, and uh, but you had done uh, nine movies. Um, gosh, nine movies, four hundred episodes, whatever overall. But the question is, uh, what did did Saffron give you any advice or anything? And what do you remember from those conversations when you were first coming in? Uh, you know what? She didn't. We didn't even talk about the work. We just oh like, great. We right. talked about her, about having ready to have her first baby, and it was kind of more situational, kind of like, what are you and doing now? Stuff. Right. Yeah. So, and so, and it was not even, I wanted to talk to her in person, but we, I think it was mostly done over, online and stuff. But yeah, I just, I thought it was really cool that she was a singer. Like, we had that in common, like that basic vocal background in general. So yeah. And, that and I didn't helps. Even really know what I was talking about. I kind of learned about stuff as I went along and I, I learned a lot from the fans because they really follow it and they go back behind the scenes and like you, they know all this trivia that not everybody knows about, right? <laughs> right. Well, uh, I was going to actually, because that's interesting. So I'm guessing, I'm assuming that the singing experience specifically for Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z I'm going to just guess that the fact that you were a singer was enough training for you to be able to handle the screams that you had to, because you had to put in some screams for this show. I'm oh, guessing that helped you out. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Crazy yeah. And so was the singing like helpful as far as training your vocal cords to handle that kind of stuff? Or no, not really. It was. And it's cool that you have that perception because not everybody knows that. And not everybody knows my history or whatever but yeah i mean i was singing all the time i mean especially once i got the role as violet valionette i chose violet because i love the color purple and i had to have a v name so that was my name for this traveling show band right and um you know i was just um growing and traveling and just learning i mean we were having to sing all the time on and off sleeping on airport airport floors Sometimes we'd have a hotel, we didn't have time to go to it, and we'd have to move to the next city. And it was, I mean, it was really crazy, especially from 91 to 2002 or three. It was crazy travel. And, um, but I mean, I learned, I, mean, I was young, I could like handle it. And then being that I had the chops to, to, to sing all the time, it definitely helped in my voice acting career for sure, especially for the screams, like you said. I mean, like, um, I mean, constant. they're definitely trying times, you know, with a lot of those sessions, especially Cell Saga, but. Being that I did have that experience and I was using my voice regularly all the time, even when you're sick, it's like, you know what, you got this show must go on, right? And so then when it would be time to do, you know, voice, sometimes it'd be once a week, once a month, three times a week. I mean, it, you know, the cell saga was pretty intense. I did a lot of stuff multiple times a week. Thankfully, I had a, a lunch break and I would just drink a lot of water and get a lot of sleep. But yeah, I mean, being a singer definitely helped a lot with the chops and the stamina and being able to reproduce those screams and then scream as long as you can and then let them work their magic on the um, te technical technological side as far as like m meshing the screams together or merging them with others and things like that but that's a really good question because 
it definitely helped to be a singer. And also matching the, the mouth flaps, you know, having a rhythm, like, like, don't hurt my dad or don't hurt my dad. You know, it's like you, you would see it on the spot and they'd give you a shot at it the first time without much direction. And then if you nailed it, that's awesome. If not, you'd do it right again right after while they were still rolling and then they could move it back into place. I think... <laughs> The yeah. one line of yours that always stands out to me, the one performance of yours that always hits me, and people talk about this all the time. This is still this. This is you recorded this. I want to say 15, 16 years ago, but it's still being talked about to this day. And that is in the BoJack movie. That line where Gohan says, "I am my father's son." That's the oh. line, dude. Yeah. Everybody loves when you nailed that line. Did, were you the one who decided to to do that? I am my father's son. Or was that Barry or whoever was directing telling you to do it like that? I, well, they definitely let me take liberty at first, usually just for efficiency's sake, to go ahead and take a, to take a stab at it. And then right. if it, what they wanted, we just do it again. But um, I think by that time I had I had learned so much and embraced the character that I was able to kind of like give it my rendition. And then I think as far as like meshing it into – what it ended up sounding like, of course, you have the background music and all this stuff going on in the background. Um, that I think they ended up using that, and they just wanted me to basically give it like the biggest scream ever, as long as I could physically handle it. Oh, and then boy. we may do. So fortunately, I mean, technology is different now. It's even crazier and more computer and whatever. But at the time, it was like you know, you literally were rewinding the tape and like trying to like match everything that way and so it was kind of like they kind of like could like overdub it a little bit and then you had like the background sounds and the you know but all you everything you saw was japanese so yeah i mean they definitely let me have my own stab at it but then i just listened to the direction if anything needed to be done or if we needed to overdub anything i was ready to do so well one of the questions i have here from one of my members is he asked about the Super Saiyan 2 Gohan transformation. Um, maybe the most iconic scene in the entire series of Dragon Ball Z anyways. It's definitely top five. And D. White wants to know how many, if you remember, was this? you record, You would have recorded this in 2000. Um, how many takes did it take for you to do the iconic Super Saiyan 2 Gohan transformation scream? And how did you do it? In, or did you do it in one try? Um, do you remember this? I mean, I, it was 20 years ago. So if you don't, I understand. It was a while back. Um... Yeah, I mean, as far as I remember, it, I mean, I had kind of worked my way up to that, and I'd been working there for a while, and being the singer on the weekends with my show band, weddings, parties, and whatever clubs, and then working during the week. I mean, we we did it pretty quick. I mean, we did, you know, maybe one, two, three, or three takes, and then, like, basically, you know, we just had to take a big, deep breath and then give it to them again, and they would sometimes, you know, see me through the window and go, okay, she's going to try again, or we would just start over. But um, if I remember correctly, we knocked it out pretty quick. I mean, it was like... We kind of built up to it, and they had the ability to kind of like you do most of the voice, uh, the voicing scenes, the speaking scenes ahead of time, and then save a lot of the screaming and more tough, enduring type of stuff towards the end. And so I was able to kind of like just blast it out, you know, for like the last 30 minutes or whatever I was there. Ah, and then, yeah. uh, then just rest my voice, get some water, get some sleep, and come back the next day. So we were, thankfully, at the time, they were able to save a lot of that for the end of the session. And, and that, that was very good. That is when Gohan became the main character, albeit for a short time. Now, did you, I heard that during the Cell Saga, it was rushed. Based on what you're telling me, I mean, now you were there. Did you feel like that production of the Cell Saga dub was rushed? Did you think it was, it was too fast? I mean, obviously... That's subjective, but I mean, in your opinion, could it have been slowed down? I know they had a deadline to meet, though. Uh, at the time, no, I didn't really even know about any deadline. I mean, I knew that they were calling me in for certain reasons for certain time frames, and that was that was great. So, no, I wasn't really aware of much of that behind-the-scenes stuff. So I didn't feel like anything was necessarily rushed at all. So it's, I just kind of did my part. It's interesting, too, because when it comes to the Super Saiyan 2 scene, you know, the... Um, the script added a bunch of extra dialogue. Like, uh, I can't believe I'm going to do this, but whatever. You were in there and you were like, 16, you love... Oh, that's my terrible... This is my terrible mimic of you. <laughs> no, it's good. This, it's, no, but it's funny because 
every fanboy listening to this right now wishes they could do what I'm about to do right now. But you were doing the whole 16, you love life, and you know, the, the, right. go, the Gohan thing. Whereas in the Japanese version, it was just one scream. It was Nozawa, because they didn't, they're very, they're much more subtle in that version. They over explain things in the, in the Z script. But uh, Nozawa delivered this incredible scream. Where it was just like, like just she let it go, and and obviously she was a lot younger back then, you know. But my question to you is, when you were there, because I know Funimation's changed a lot since then. Did they ever show you the Japanese version? Because I remember hearing actors say, "I didn't even watch it in the Japanese version until we came back to do Kai." Like, I did. They, did they actually show you any of the audio clips from that version, just so you can kind of get acclimated to how they did things? Ah, uh, do not recall that at all. Um, other than what what I would see visually, but the um, the sound was muted, so I wouldn't have right. that as a reference. No, I was so. just curious because that was that, I mean, your scream was great. Don't get me wrong, but I'm saying like that scream is very important. I was just wondering if they had shown you, okay, this is how they did it, and can uh, you match it? You know, right? No, I mean, I think as far as length. By watching something every once in a blue moon, they'd be like, "Okay, let's watch this first. It might be helpful." Right. But most part is like, let's let them take a stab at it. Especially once I established the character and knew in the voice in the in my throat where the character voice was. Um, and a lot of time, for efficiency's sake, they'd be like, "You know what? Let's just let them try it. Let's just try it out." And then sometimes. Once I would try something and then say that I thought the rhythm was slightly off based on the mouth flaps that I was viewing, I would do it again. And then I would usually nail it the second or third time and they would just slide it into place. Like I said, the, the technology at the time was much more primitive. So it was less less computer. I mean, I said, we had, they had computers and stuff, but it was like, ooh, I don't want to well, say it. They were also cheap from what I understand. Funimation uh, did not have the best equipment back then. Back in the day, yeah, that was kind of back. But a lot of us played multiple roles. We did the whole Wallace stuff and the background roles and ladies screaming and babies crying and things like that, which is also a lot of fun to do. Right. Uh, but yeah, there was definitely a smaller um, pool of talent, and it was just a smaller company in general. And then they just slowly grew and, and started acquiring more parts of the building and more levels of the building and just kind of grew from there and started taking more properties on and, and developing more um, vocal booths and studios. It was like Studio A, then it became Studio B, or Studio A, B, and then A, B, and C, and then we had like three going at once, which is cool, and they picked up more properties. Yes, yeah, they were growing little by little, yeah. I mean, the, the, the reality is Dragon Ball Z kind of saved Funimation in a way. Like, I hate to say it, but it's true. Like, Funimation would not be where it's at dubbing all these shows had it not been for the success of Dragon Ball Z. Point blank. I mean, they were they had nothing before Dragon Ball Z, and then they got Yu Yu Hakusho and Fruits Baskets and yeah. But and maybe, I, still, I don't know if anybody knows this. Not to brag at all, but being a singer, and then when they were trying to kind of reduce some of these Japanese themes, I was able to like be a part of some of that as well. I was the um, opening and closing themes lead vocalist for Kitty Grade. And as far as uh, Yu Yu Hakusho, I did um, Sayonara Bye Bye. Oh, you sang that? I did Sayonara Bye Bye in English dub. And that then, is great. Um, we did that is a great song. Band. Yeah, such a, you know, the fans don't realize that sometimes. And they'll, sometimes every once in a blue moon, a fan will come to me like, you sing Sayonara Bye Bye from Yu Yu Hakusho. And then I played like the tournament, tournament amount, uh, tournament, uh, tournament announcer in Yu Yu right. Hakusho, which she didn't really have a name, but I did some, that was a small role, but. Um, every once in a blue moon, I'll get somebody to come up and say, oh, I remember you from New York show. And they, I don't know how they did the research, but they're like, how did you know this? And then I would sign stuff for them based on that. And so, yeah, I mean, I had a little part in a little bit of that other stuff. And I also did some uh, directing. I directed Tiffany Vollmer in a, um, a, an animation theme. They ended up not going with her for this, uh, the selection in the long run, but it was a really good experience for us because we were friends and we had been working together with Dragon Ball and she was Bulma and I was Goku and um, yep. it was a really cool, awesome thing for me to do, to be behind the scenes and like be directing somebody. And I'd definitely be open to doing some more of that in the future to kind of like pull out the best of what I can get out of an actor. You know, I've heard a lot of people say that directing is more fun. I don't know. I, I, I definitely would be up for it if the, if the, if the chance ever became open. Well, you got the experience. So when Funimation first took over the production of Dragon Ball, 
They dubbed two OG Dragon Ball movies, Sleeping Princess and Devil's Castle and Mystical Adventure, and they hired somebody named Saley Delgadillo to voice Kid Goku. She also yeah. yeah, and she voiced Dende and Z and but it was all redubbed by Laura Bailey later on. I do not know what happened to her, but I know that you came in to replace Saley Delgadillo. First of all, do you have any idea? Have you ever met this person? This is like one of the big yeah. anomalies and mysteries of of uh, of this cast because nobody ever talks about her. I did meet her. She was precious. I met her at a, the very first cast party we ever had, which at the time, that's all we knew. We didn't know anything different and they were small you know it was just the directors and then you know like maybe what eight or nine people that voiced the main characters of at the time dragon ball z because that's the the show we were working on but i def i did meet her sweetheart i i don't know what happened to her exactly as far as where she went with her career or she moved away or exactly what happened there but yeah she played dende the original dende and i remember they were teasing her because like we all had like these iconic lines that the directors thought were funny. And so they like printed out these little pictures of our character, which for me was Kid Gohan. For sure. And my big line, because I was, a, they called me the reactress, because Gohan had a lot of shock and awe and like, like these reactions that were like, Ugh, yeah, you're uh, like, no. yeah, I, I remember what? that vividly. Don't hurt my dad. Huh. Uh. Ah. You know, just <laughs> all, constant, off and on. Uh, it's funny to look on the internet because some people will do com- compilations of it and it's just like reactor, reactress or reaction after reaction. But yeah, uh, the the one you're speaking of, I did meet her at the first um, cast party. She's a sweet, sweet, sweet girl. I don't know what happened to her. Well, but yeah, then whenever then they came back, they had, re- yeah, they recast, but. Yeah, no, she was great. She, I think, yeah, she did do some Kid Goku. Yeah, she was. I came around. I guess they had done some of the Dragon Ball stuff with, I know Mike McFarlane was there early on too. Yes, yeah, this, w- th- this would have been right before they started back with Z. This is like right before, because Sleeping right. Princess in Devil's Castle was like the first time that Chris Sabat had ever been on, like, like that was his first thing, like, because it was right. right before episode 54. Um, and so with Kid Goku, with respect to that, did you audition for that? Or you said the role was just offered to you, right? For the most part, the role of Kid Goku was in the hopes that I would be able to, to, to represent do it. Yeah. a yeah a, a, a character voice that was similar to Gohan and reflective of that being that they're related, but also be a different delivery through the acting, which thankfully I had some theater and some background. I actually majored in drama in college um, for a couple of years before joining that band and running away and being crazy on the road. But, <laughs> but right. yeah, but no, um, that ended up working out to my advantage because I was able to, and it was actually better and easier for me on my throat being that I didn't have to be so raspy and I could be like a little higher in the voice and a little more care, you know, carefree. Right. I'm just kind of, just, yeah, here we go. Instead of like, you know, which, yes. No, some people like, some people don't. I don't know. I've heard different, different people, you know, with their commentary about what they liked about it. I thought, oh, it's just kind of raspy, whatever. You know, and what's what's interesting is I, I'm fine with it. Like I, I've got a really tough skin, especially moving around being the new girl all the time. But you know, the, I just did what the directors told me to do. So they wanted the rasp with Gohan, and they wanted it to be not so much with Goku. And so that's what I did, and that also changed the delivery, in the sense that he's. Some, well, I say somewhat younger, but he's also had this more carefree, innocent, raised in the woods kind of thing. I don't right, know. Right, yeah. He, he, he was an orphan, whereas Gohan had his parents for the most right, part. And, right, and then Gohan also had the influence of Piccolo on his yeah. uh, training and whatsoever. I mean, Goku had his, you know, his little friend, little Krillin and Master Roshi, and that's kind of what he did. And so, yeah, so I was able to, thankfully, you know, get cast as kid goku and they were happy with it and you know him flying around in his nimbus cloud and all that stuff it ended up working to my you know in my favor and thankfully that worked out and you know and I, in my opinion they sound 
different enough to definitely be different different characters, but no, also be related. Absolutely, absolutely. That they, they do sound different. I mean, I everybody loves, and I've always said it. I've told everybody, everybody loves the kid Goku. I, I even love your kid Goku, um, for sure. And actually, one of the questions I got here is. Who did you enjoy portraying more, Kid Goku or Gohan? And I want to also ask you if there was any pressure to do Goku because even though I feel like in the West, Goku as an adult was probably the more well-known version because of the fact that he, that Z came here, well, Z didn't come here first, but it got popular first. But Kid Goku is still extremely iconic and extremely important. If you go to Japan... And you go to the subways, it's Kid Goku, not adult Goku on the posters. Like, he's... Kid Goku is, like, representative of the 80s innocence of, of Japan, I feel. So you got uh -huh. to play that character. Go, was there any pressure there? And who would you enjoy portraying more now looking back? Uh, well, I have a, I have an affection for both for different reasons. I know that the, the Kid Gohan, being that that was the first one I was cast as, like, kind of like, oh, that's where it all started. You know, it's like, you know, nostalgia. And then him being kind of like, a representation it's it's kind of funny it's just ironic that this kid gohan character kind of like i could relate to being that i was like always in the background moving around kind of not sure what to do when but definitely caring so much about my friends and getting upset when people would mess with my friends or people i cared about because in my real life that's kind of what happened with me and moving around being you know the, the new kid and people picking on people and i just it just it was very you know that you know, hit a hit a chord with me, and so I definitely could relate to that. And then, and then when he finally unleashes, and he's like, "No more, no more." Yeah, basically, it's my representation of don't bully people, stop being so mean, mean people suck. You know, this whole concept of that. And but then, when Kid Goku came around with Dragon Ball, which kind of came out of left field, I didn't really know what was going on there. But then, being so innocent, the little boy that I can never be <laughs> and also to be so comedic and so funny because that's like my heart is like comedic stuff making people laugh laughing enjoying life laughter is the best medicine that's like my big Agreed. deal you know so I, I, I for two different reasons you know like I loved them both but for two completely different reasons and you know based on my own personal life experience is why you know but definitely I had a blast voicing innocent young Goku and he was just so funny because he didn't know the difference between a girl and a boy. And right. he you know, was raised and he was just so fearless. Like, you know, this ninja is like throwing stuff and it could like slice his throat. And he's like, can't catch me. <laughs> and he's running away. You know? <laughs> like, okay, well, he's just, you know, I guess the kind of a little kid I wish I could have been, you know, but being ripped from school to school and just trying to find my identity and being able to kind of relate to this little, little boy, you know, it was really, it was very refreshing for me. Well, with Kid Goku and GT, we have an older man, a grandpa, in the body of a child. So, did you yeah. approach this version of Goku differently? Because this is not the same as Dragon Ball Goku. Exactly, and that's a good point that you make. Um, yeah, because he was experienced. He had been an adult. He was turned back into a kid. Like you yeah. said, as a grandpa. And, and then you've got this really cool new sci-fi kind of... You know, the animation was so much more progressed, and, right? Um, which I thought was great. It looked amazing. The, but you know, it's funny the characters, or I say the characters, the fans are really so much more into Dragon Ball and Dragon, Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z. Right. But you get the occasional fan will come up and be like, you know what? Oh man! Oh, you voiced Goku from GT. Oh wow! And they really, really liked it and embraced it. But for the most part, it was you know they preferred and you know the Dragon Ball. I think it also is because Dragon Ball Dragon Ball Z had so many more episodes. And it was it, more it, it was Toriyama's vision, whereas GT was a combination of different people at Toei. It was more... GT yeah, was, it came was, after. It came after. It was seen as more of a cash grab, even though... Uh, like, let's like let's just like, yeah. like make this like go further so there can be yep. more money. Yep. Yeah. That's exactly what happened. We, we're, we're making so much money with this. This is what the Japanese said. We don't want to end it now. So Toriyama's end the manga, and they're like, well, can we just keep this going like a little bit longer? And they did. Um, right. But, but okay. I mean, did you – but you did kind of recognize the different Goku. So did you like – you kept the same voice, but you kind of – was the demeanor more mature? Like he seemed a little bit more determined in GT than he did in Dragon Ball. Yeah, and then being, like you said – being like an experienced an adult, uh, adult, 
then he changed back into a child. So he still had like the childhood, childhood like I hate shots, bleh, you know, whatever. But he was. Hmm. I think the 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 delivery was definitely like okay, this this guy's been around a while, and he's looking after his peeps, and you know, taking care of Pan, and had much more knowledge. And then I, that's fortunately, thankfully, I have some theater background, and I was able to kind of put that into the character not just the voice but to be like you know what this is a older this is an older goku he's already been there done that he's lived many 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 years he just happens to be in the body of kid goku so i definitely hoped that and thankfully i think i did i hopefully achieved that concept of being older and more mature and actually kind of presenting that through the through the voice delivery of a younger of a, i'm sorry an older goku yeah. it, just it, it, I can imagine it being challenging. That's probably challenging, right? Because you're, you're, you, you don't want to do a kid, but you don't want to do an adult either. It's tricky, I'm guessing. Yeah, and then uh, and obviously, first and foremost, is taking direction from the director because they know they know all and they they know what they want and they know what they want to hear. So, definitely paying good close attention to that and being you know focused on what their direction is, and then also them kind of saying, "Hey, this is what's going on." Because sometimes we just move them from. Uh, I say fast forward, that sounds so 80s, but fast forward into the parts where you were actually supposed to, you know, dub the voice. And sometimes they would need to kind of say, okay, here's what's going on. And they fast forwarded quite a bit. And they were like, oh, this is going on. This is what's going on here. This is going on there. And then you may put the emphasis on what they want. And they're like, okay, it's higher stakes. And then you do it again. But you become so good at like following that direction on the spot and being focused. It's like, so it all, it all ended up working out, and thankfully, I think I felt like I did pretty good on that. And especially after having already voiced Gohan throughout dr the Dragon Ball series, Dragon Ball Z series, and then all going back after we, ex you know, conquered, well, I say conquered Dragon Ball, and then finishing one through fifty four through Dragon Ball Z, I'd had that experience. I had you know several years there that yep. helped aid to those chops to be able to be like, okay, this is Goku. He's older. And he's lit, he's a grandpa, but look now he's a little boy again. So just to like depict that older quality in the um, in the voice through the acting, you know. And and that's why I felt like it, it would have been interesting to have heard you do Kai because with Kai you mm -hmm. would have had the experience at that point. Um, it would have been you know you would have been doing it at this point at that point you would have been voicing these characters for eleven years. Um, so at that point you would have already it would have and plus the video games. We, you had to do the voice right. for the video games as well, so you you kind of lived, ate and and breathed Goku and Gohan for like a decade, it seems. But uh, yeah, you're right there. Now, and I would have loved to have taken that on, but yeah, no, that that makes a, a lot of sense. Yep, especially well, with it being kind of like a reprise or a reprise or whatever you call that. Yeah, when you come back and like come back and like do your role again, but in a different series. Well, the same series, different but like, script. Right. Yeah, much more accurate. Well, I was going to, and then you had to keep doing the same. No, it's just funny because you doing the video games, it's like the same lines over and over again. Because <laughs> there was a time when they would put a new, they would put one or two new games out every every year. Uh, Dragon Ball Z, Budokai 2, Budokai 3, Budokai Tenkaichi. Right. And you had to, you probably had to go in there and do uh, 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 like those lines a million times, I'm guessing, right? Like the punches and the kicks, right. uh, uh, like those random like sound yeah. bites. Yeah, and then they get placed where they need to be with the game. Exactly. But it's like, it was crazy. I mean, thankfully, I've had experience doing the voice. And so as far as coming up with the voice on the spot was not a, was not an issue. It was just a matter of um, portraying those, you know, those exact um, parts of the script, but also like shorter, longer, all kinds of different inflections in the voice so that you could portray this so that they could be placed in the video game when someone's actually playing it, that that's actually you know what it's supposed what he's supposed to be saying. So yeah, it was it was it wasn't uh, it wasn't harder per se, but it was definitely a whole different um, experience voicing a, a video game, being that you're just like, da, and then like okay, a little bit longer, yeah, and then you just give all these it's like boom 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 like kind of like rapid fire kind of voice acting, right. Uh, Definitely was not is not a problem or anything, but it's definitely different to voice for a video game. And then like making sure that whenever you say the line or you know ended up being kind of a little bit of mimicking in the sense that I know Sabbath was 
um, directing at the time, and he would say, "Okay, let's do this." Hoo -hoo -ja. I mean, hoo -hoo -ja. I mean, like, I, I, which was helpful. I mean, some people don't like to be given the line to like portray, but it was helpful for me being a mimic to be able to, oh, okay, so I could get the timing of it just right. right. And for efficiency's sake, yeah, okay, you do it first, and then I'll just follow you. It makes yeah. it easier. So was was Barry Watson easy to work with or hard to work with? Everybody has an opinion on Barry, and I always like to ask everybody. Barry Watson. Um, early on, um, I, I say it's difficult, but that was also me being um, – like, oh my gosh, what am I, I really, you know, especially with my history of being like a new girl all the time, all these experiences of like being ripped and then translated into all these different places and places to live. And so I, at the beginning, I remember being so intimidated and like, I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't have any idea what Japanese anime was. I don't even think they told me it was Japanese, Japanese anime. I didn't even know about that until I ended up at a convention in like 2000, but I just remember wanting so hard to please the director and to do a good job and to be like, oh, okay, this is a whole new facet of my career. What am I doing? What do, how do what do I do? How do I respond? And so, yeah, I mean, he wasn't difficult to work with by any means, um, but it was, he was a little bit like, he'd already been directing for a while and I had never actually voiced a you character. You were a rookie. Yeah. I was a rookie in the professional sense of being like, okay, I'm a voice actress now, you know? I did it for fun all my life, but that's a whole different ball game. And so, yeah, I mean, the first few weeks, I was very intimidated. Like, I just didn't, I I was struggling with, okay, what do they want from me? What do they need from me? Is this good enough? Am I going to be able to keep this role? What is this all about kind of thing? But then once I was there for a while and it was coming back once a week, once every other week or whatever, then I was like, oh. I, I, okay, this is cool, you know, this is all right, you know, and he would be just like, you got to do it again, I'll do it again, and then it just got easier as we went along with different, um, you know, directors along the way. Okay, um, just, I was just curious, so moving on, so you're, you, let's talk about kind of what happened at, at the, 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 the tail end here, so you, mm -hmm. when when Kai came along, Colleen Clinkenbeard took over, they, they made some changes, they replaced um, Colleen, I'm sorry, they, they replaced you with Colleen, they replaced um, Tiffany with Monica Rial, and they replaced, um, well, these are the three big ones. There were, there were a few other smaller ones, but they also replaced I... Linda Young as Frieza. And the, the Linda Young replacement was more so because the Frieza and Kai talked faster, and at uh -huh. the time, they wanted Chris Ayers. He's a fast-talking guy. You know, da, 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 da. You know, he's very good at it. Um, so what happened there? What People want you to come back and voice Gohan, there's a big part of the fandom that wishes you still did it in Kai. So what, what were your memories of that time period? That was out of the blue. I didn't have a clue. I didn't have any idea. I mean, I was just kind of moving along with my life, singing on weekends with party bands and, you know, rocking my personal world and planning a marriage and hoping to be a mama and all these things were going on in my personal life. And then, boom, out of the blue, February 2011 hits and, like, I get this onslaught of this like crazy, insane internet, like crazoid, like p all these people and fans are like, Oh my God, what happened? Where are you? Um, hmm. where is Stephanie Nadalny as Gohan? Bring her back, bring her back. And I had no idea what was going on. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you were living in your own bubble at the time. Yeah. And I thought everything was cool. I definitely thought everything was okay as far as like um, my professional life with with the actors, actresses, directors, and and uh, staff at Funimation. So when I found out I was technically replaced, I was completely like sucker punched. Like I had no idea that was going on. And I remember a friend of mine in the industry who also worked there was like, "Oh my God, you won't believe this!" And she kind of gave me this little like background without trying to cause any issues or definitely don't want to hurt me or anything but she's like oh my god they replaced you they replaced so and so and it's crazy now and you know we have to go in and put our heads down and hope that we don't get replaced too and I was like what are you talking about I don't understand and so then there was this onslaught of like fans that were like oh my gosh you have to bring Stephanie back well I had no idea that I had been replaced I had no idea that there was a Dragon Ball Z Kai I didn't even know it existed to be honest right. so when it happened I mean I got I mean, I was thrown back at first, and then after I kind of let it sit in, I got really, really sad and really hurt, like, like um, personally hurt about it. Like, what did I do? Um, did I do something wrong? Um, 
was why did they make these changes and um as much as I thought, okay, I'm the only one being replaced and then other people replaced, it kind of was a little bit of comfort, but I, man, I didn't want other people to be replaced either. But it was like, okay, so they're making some directional changes. And being from my history of being bullied and moved around and transplanted, like that like really hit that, that nerve of being like, okay, I'm not being accepted. Maybe I'm not good enough. I don't fit in the crowd. I'm not with the popular crowd, I'm not with the click or whatever, whatever, you know, right. whatever it is. Yeah, it makes and sense. I just felt like, okay, I guess I just don't belong anymore. Or I don't know. It, it, it was, it was very, very painful to just, especially not being kind of like alerted ahead of time. Like, you know what, we're going to make some changes. You've had a great run or this is great. I didn't get any of that. It was just, boom, I was gone. And it was very painful because it was a big part of my livelihood, especially something that you, I could do that was unique, not just the singing and the traveling with the show band. This was like, this is voicing characters. This is Japanese anime. This is something unique that now all of a sudden I have an IMDb page and a Wikipedia page. I didn't even know about until then <laughs> or around that time, maybe a little bit sooner than that, but I was just like, Oh my gosh. So yeah, I took it. I mean, I tried not to take it personally, but it really hurt. Like right. it really hurt. So, yeah, I don't know why they did that, but uh, I definitely didn't try to intervene or, like, beg for my rollback or anything. I just kind of stepped aside and let the directors do what they felt they needed to do and just tried to remain professional and wish everybody the best. But, I, I, you know, since then, it's been a long road because I seem to be, of, I don't know if it's blacklisted or shunned or whatever, but I haven't been able to get back in to, fun, uh, to the Funimation scene since an audition I had in 2009 and ever since then, it's just been kind of like crickets, you know? Well, hopefully so, yeah. that's not the case. Well, well, let me ask you a question. You said you were talking about your, the passing of your mom earlier. And, yeah. um, I wanted to get into some of the trauma you had gone through. Cause I, you went through hell for a while and now you're yeah. getting out of it. And I think that this story is inspiring for a lot of people. So, when your mom passed, I'm going to guess, and this is me guessing because I had my mom die when I was 22 of cancer. Uh, you went through a form of depression probably. You were probably very emotionally distraught. And I'm going to – I know you've talked about how in the past you had issues with you know substances like alcohol and things like that. Was yeah. Are those events plus your childhood trauma linked? Like do you think that all of that kind of – like all the bad stuff you went through kind of led to you going down a darker path and then coming back out of it. Because a lot of people go through this and yeah. I don't want them to make the same mistakes that, that others have made. If you don't mind talking about that, that'd be great. No, no, I'm ready. This is the time. I mean, yes, it's, it's interesting you brought that up because I'm actually um, – over the past year – well, several years. I mean, but especially this past year, I'm like, you know what? Cause I went, we'll go back a little bit. So you talk about yeah, the death of my mother was in 99. That was August of 99. She actually was able to fortunately see me get cast as this kid, Gohan. She was so funny. She's like, what's his name again? Is it Gonad? <laughs> I was like, no, my mom was really funny. And well, cute. So, so 99 was a crazy year for you then. Yeah. 99 was a big, fat, juicy, honker, crazy year. But th honestly, there's a lot more that we can definitely talk about, but that was the, biggest like first big giant blow like oh my gosh because my mom was my oasis she was my biggest fan my best friend she was my everything no no discount to my father but my my mom and my dad split when i was six and then she remarried my mom remarried a year later to my stepdad who was very staunch military, military crazy army you, you know you're wrong you're bad you you should live in shame if you tell a little lie that a little seven-year-old would do like everybody or whatever you were punished like severely for like a month no tv for like a month and when you're seven <clears throat> excuse me seven or eight to have like your favorite thing being taken for me for me was my donna summer records because i was a singer and i wanted to be a singer and so all my disco records at the time i know it sounds kind of funny and petty and weird but like in my seven-year-old world eight-year-old whatever no, that was my kid favorite thing. Right. Like he was going for the jugular, but like he was also raised that way too. So over time, many, 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 many years, I'm learning to forgive him. But for a long time, that way of being raised and me just being this creative ball of energy that just wanted love and wanted to give love, exude love, share love, 
And then to have this staunch, crazy, insane, like, well, I say insane, but he wasn't, but he was six foot four, 360 pounds. And I'm this, this tiny, scrawny little kid. And so then I'm like punished all the time. None of my friends were punished anywhere near like that. All my friends were like, what's wrong with your stepdad? Why is he so mean? Why is he not? He wouldn't say hi. I mean, he just, that was just who he was. And so I had this influence. And then I had my father all of a sudden out of, out of state from age six till current. Like he's, he's in Indiana. I, I haven't seen him in seven or eight years since I got married. I mean, I, so when my mom got sick and was boom, she was gone. Uh, toxic exposure from when we lived in Kansas and boom, she's gone. This aggressive cancer took her out. And she died on a release date when she was supposed to get out. She was doing great. Jesus. It was just, boom, this giant bomb went off. And, like, my, the essence of anything I ever considered to be um, any kind of consolation, oasis, like, uh, unconditional love was gone. Boom. And thank God I had her as long as I did. So I'm not trying to complain. But, and I know it happened for a reason, but... That was like, I felt like everything was gone and I didn't know what to do. So I just had to completely get out of everything I was doing and start over and just, I bought a house. I got out of renting and I completely started from scratch. I was eating ramen noodles. I had hardly any money. I was just trying to save every, I didn't have cable. I didn't have anything special. Wait, was this in 99 or was this more recent that you're talking about? No, this is 1999 when that happened. Oh wow! So 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 you yeah. were just about to voice Gohan. You were just about getting ready to do this big career move. That right. is that's crazy. That is that's a it, crazy it's, story. The cool thing though is that I did get cast. Like I auditioned December ninety eight, got cast in January of ninety nine. Right. And she was able. I was able to share that with her, yes. and then it was actually aired. Like she was able to actually we actually turn on Cartoon Network like in July of the next year or well ninety nine September and there it was and not like oh my god my mom's getting to experience it of course I didn't know she's gonna pass away but at the same time right. we, we were doing like VHS tapes you know they were right. giving us VHS tapes of this stuff and so she was able and was able to share that with her and she was just about to be a grandmother for the first time just about three weeks my brother was ready to have baby for his first baby little girl and that's my niece Sarah she's twenty one. And, Lovely. um, so the, the timing just, I don't know, it was hard to not be angry. Right. You know, cause like everything was starting to, I was starting to kind of feel like I was finally blossoming as an adult. Cause I guess I was kind of stunted in a way, especially when she died. And then, you know, I had this new career and I had this scene stuff and then that happened. And then my brother had his first baby and everything was just crazy. And then I did pretty good. I was able to, you know, do okay. And be. I guess I was stronger than I thought I was. A lot of people say, no, you're stronger than you think. You've got this spirit from your mother and she's always there. She's your, you know, no, your you, you are stronger than you think. I believe that. Yeah. Right. And then I know that we're going to end up talking about this anyway. So then if you fast forward and then we go into, okay, um, I get married. Well, I start planning a, a wedding, um, with a, a friend of mine's big brother from Durant, Oklahoma, where I grew up from fifth eighth grade. So then all this was happening. I thought, Oh, I'm going to get married. I'm going to have a family. I'm going to have all these roots and have babies. I'm going to do, be like my mom and I'm going to just settle down, but still have a career. Um, and then boom, like all these other things happen. Like I got divorced. I lost my job at the Windstar casino, which wasn't my fault. It was just kind of the end of a promotion. That was the, we were the home, uh, the house band for the Windstar Casino Casino in Thackerville, Oklahoma. We were the high rollers. You can find out a lot of that on YouTube and some stuff. You can go to Windstar, Stephanie and Dolan. We've got like a compilation. So I was doing that. I was uh, about to be, uh, be able to have my first child, and then that was unviable. So, boom, I've got the loss of a pregnancy, the loss of a marriage, the loss of my job. My aunt Brenda, who gave my mom the bone marrow and that saved her life for five months, died. My best friend stole my identity. I lost tons of money through that. Jesus. So boom. And so then I didn't know how to cope at all. I was like, what do I do now? I was lost. I wasn't working at Funimation. Life was throwing I a bunch thinking. of shit at you. Everything I wanted to do and be was gone. I wasn't going to be a mom. I wasn't going to be married. I'm going to interrupt you. What year was this when all this when this was going on? 2015. Okay, this was 2015. Okay, this is more recent. So this is when you really yeah. hit rock bottom. 
the yeah, I hit crazy rock bottom. Okay. Like almost okay. didn't survive so many times. I think it was it started at the end of 2014, and then everything got really, really progressively bad between February. That's when I lost the pregnancy lost the marriage everything fell apart best friend i mean all this happened in like literally like five months five six months and then all of a sudden i had no idea who i was what i was going to do how i was going to make money what was going to happen to my house what was going to happen to my life Mm. i was alone i felt orphaned um and i just fell into this huge dark abyss of unknown fear anxiety depression pain suffering what do I do? I literally had no idea what I was going to do, where I was going to do it, and how I was going to survive. And the only thing I knew how to do was to turn to poor, the poor decision of drinking. I had no, I didn't want to feel, I didn't want to live. I didn't want to, I didn't want to commit suicide. I definitely didn't want to end my life by any means. And there was some mental stuff there, but yeah, but I didn't know how to get through literally an hour of the day. It was so bad and so hard and I could have died so many times. And I don't, I I know now uh, after another, what, five years or so that I'm supposed to be here to help other people with my story, whether it be through the addiction or through the loss, grief, pain, anxiety. I'm a real person here. Yeah. I had this great career and I hopefully continue to have a great career and I'm doing these conventions now, but there was a time when I literally had no idea where to turn. And I had this faith down deep inside of me and the presence of the, my mother in my life and her influence in her just beautiful existence of what little I had of her. And that's what kept me going, you know, and the faith that I knew I could do something good and give back and not make poor decisions. And wow, look, I can be a mom to all these fans. I can be a mom in another way. I can have animals. I can have, you know, so it's just been a really transforming year, especially this year. Rebirth, coming up, what do you say, the rise in the phoenix? I mean, I was literally, I I mean, and I'm like a social person. I love people, want to hug people, get all over Facebook. I'm all over that. I disappeared. I didn't want to promote anything negative. I didn't want to bring anybody down. So I basically just completely hid under a rock. And then I allowed the fact that I was replaced and all these things just torment me like demons. And I couldn't sleep. I couldn't function barely. I didn't want to drive. I was scared. I was jumpy. I was nervous. I was just absolutely broken into pieces. And thank God I found a way out of it. And it, it, and it did, it was not easy. It, It took a lot of work. It took a lot of self-reflection, a lot of um, just extreme humbleness and just be like, okay, what, a, who am I? What, a, why am I still here? I mean, I'm in my forties. I mean, this is ridiculous. I should be managing things better here, mm-hmm. but I was broken and I was lost and I'm good now. I, I'm coming in and out of it now. And, and I'm so grateful. My, my whole perspective has changed. I know I can help people and give back and do good things now. And I can help other people who are struggling with similar situations, whether it be substance abuse, um, alcohol, um, poor coping skills, just the bullying thing is that goes hardcore. I I want to hear you talk about that. Yeah. The six and seven year old little girl that didn't know who she was and was just constantly ripped and torn from these schools that I hadn't, you know, it was not up to me to be there or to move there, but then I would just attach to people and then boom, I'll be ripped from that school to another one. And so, and that's why I love Facebook, which I try not to let it take over and I don't want it to be in a, another a really bad addiction, but I love being like in contact with all my old friends, from all these crazy moves all growing up and stuff. And, and I just love that I, I don't have to do it alone anymore. I thought I was all on my own and I had to do this by myself. And that's just not the case. There's people out there. There's groups out there. There's 12-step programs. There's sponsors. There's people that have been through similar situations that want to help. And now I know I have a purpose and I can help other people who've been through this or who are suffering. And I can, I have a purpose now. And I lost that purpose for so long. I had no idea what I was going to do. And um, yeah, thank God for my mom and her spirit and 
whatever optimism was left, you know, there was a glimmer that was never completely shunned that I was able to cling to, to become who I am now. So do you think that it was, um, now looking back, reflecting back on your life, the, the trauma of, you know, being, like you said, moving all the time, not being able to establish close friendships, then your mom passes, then all these things happen to you where you, you go through the, you know, your, your relationship thing and you, you got, you, said you were, you, you were going to get married, you had a miscarriage, all this trauma, all this like bad luck one after another, which can destroy anybody. I, I certainly don't blame you for that because it destroys anyone. I sympathize with that and you came out of it, but that's what kind of turned you to, is that what kind of turned you? So you, you, did you turn to drinking as, as a coping mechanism? Is that kind of what it was? Yes. I, you know, I didn't know, um, I didn't know what to do or where to go. And I didn't want to feel what I was feeling because it was just absolutely, I mean, being, I'm just a very feeling, um, person. I, my expression runs deep and I'm like, my heart's huge. And I like, I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful thing, but it can be a curse because it just, just tortures you because you feel so deeply, but I wouldn't change that because when I feel deeply, I, I'm, I have a big heart for others and, and that that's what I've been able to cling to to help sustain my life and to get me out of this torment and out of this uh, this dungeon of just demons and you know the devil or whatever you want to call it you know right. whatever's trying to get you and grab you and just take you down over and over and over and it's been a roller coaster you know I'm not going to say it's been easy it hasn't but I'm just so grateful to be alive today and to be able to talk about this and not live in shame anymore. You know, I was raised to live in shame. My stepdad was like, you're wrong. You're bad. You're wrong. You're bad. You need, you know, just, you know, punishment. And, and so then I started to believe that I was bad. And then I went out and thought I was doing good. And I thought, well, maybe I was doing some bad things, making some poor decisions. But now I realize that, you know what, uh, I'm still a human being and I, I have feelings and I have a lot to give life, a lot to give back. And, right. Look at what I'm learning. I mean, okay, so I'm not the mom with the little picket fence and the little babies, and that's what I wanted. But you know what? It's not always what you want. I'm just glad to be alive, you know, to help other people. And that's what I've been clinging to lately, especially over the past few years. Like, you know what? Okay, this is life, and I'm learning how to accept life on life's terms and to be humble and be like, you know what? I am alive. I wake up. I'm thankful. I have a car, I can drive, <laughs> I have a house, I have shelter, I have food, you know, it's the whole perspective, right, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, humility. Well, um, so, with all this has gone on, like, you mentioned earlier that you said that alcoholism and substance abuse is a sickness, is an mm -hmm. illness, right? Um, mm -hmm. What would you say to somebody who might be listening to this now who has had a rough patch whether it be through covid or maybe somebody passed away and they're like with what you went through they had a miscarriage what would you say to somebody who's thinking about or already beginning the process of going down the path of drinking or maybe doing pills or whatever do you have anything to say to them being somebody who has made it out to their side oh yeah well i mean i definitely you know the thing is is whoever you are you're you are i don't want to say you're trapped in your own body or your own life but that is your life and that's all you have and so my advice would be don't feel like you have to do it alone because in a lot of extreme cases you simply can't did you go to rehab and i did okay. i went to treatment yes i did i, I went curious. several times from let's see 2000 i'm trying to think of the years because 15 was really bad um that's when it all kind of just took me out of the game and I def I went to treatment that year for let's see I think 30 days and then the next year I went for 60 and then as recently of this year I went for 60 more days just to make sure right. that I didn't go back down that path because um, seriously sometimes it's just that one drink or that one pill or that one you know some people are addicted to eating shopping um, kleptomania I mean it's the, it could be anything that takes you out of the game that that grabs you distracts you, you from life it distracts right? you from the good and the positive things you can do in this life and you just don't have to do it alone and some people are like oh it's a weakness or they don't understand but i'm sorry and that's fine that that's them but i have seen firsthand and heard 
story after story through meetings, 12 step groups, sponsors, detoxes, treatment, you know, med uh, psychiatrists, medication management. I mean, you name it, therapy. I am not above any of it. Nobody is. We need help. Be like, just to get through life, you know? And I would just say, get help. Reach out. Don't be ashamed. Don't feel like you're bad or you're wrong. It's an illness. And, you know, you need help. You don't, and you don't have to do it alone. And I was so independent after having lost my mother so young. I thought I had to do everything by myself. I had to be, okay, well, this is up to me. I'm going to be independent and I'm going to go buy a house and I'm going to get a job and, you know, all these things. And then when everything fell apart, I couldn't do it by myself. And thank God I didn't have to because there's help out there. There's definitely help. There are, I mean, suicide hotlines. There's the, the anti-bullying campaign that I've been doing off and on. Um, just don't give up. Just your life is precious. You have a purpose. It's just a matter of getting the help you need to to allow that to come to fruition, you know, and I'm talking like literally five minutes at a time. There was a time when I needed help to just get through five minutes. That's crazy. Cause I was so lost. I was, I just, okay, take a shower, make the bed. I mean, it was that bad. Like I, wow. I was like, how do I live? I had to completely retrain myself as just basic life skills just to get through a day. And thank God I saved. <laughs> I right. saved money since I was like seven. And I had some money to help me get through these times when I literally was unable to work and rebuild my life. And now it's good. Now I'm like, wow, I'm a miracle. Everybody's a miracle. We're walking around. We're alive. And we got a pandemic. We've got illness. We've got pain, suffering, loss. Everybody is going through something, right? right. So, yeah, I would just want to encourage them to not give up. You have a human spirit. You're a child of God or child of the universe or a higher power, whatever you believe, right? Mm -hmm. Something that's more powerful than yourself. There's, it's there. What would you say to somebody who's being bullied? Because you mentioned bullying a lot and what, yeah. I see you've dealt with that in the past. How would you, what would you say to somebody who, who is getting, and when we say bully, we're not talking about even little kids here. There's bullying in the workplace, in corporate America, on the internet. You don't have to be a child to get bullied. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yes, exactly. And that's why I'm such a big advocate because I have not just endured it as being the new girl in these small towns or whatever all these years, but also in the industry. I mean, even now, I mean, I'm having to like rebuild my career, like literally from like nothing. <laughs> if anything, it's harder because I'm having to face these issues that I had to go through and these whatever decisions I made back in the day. And I have to accept that those happened embrace them and say, you know what? I did some things here to try to get through. And I was just trying to survive. I didn't have a bad intention. My heart was in the right place. I didn't know what to do. I was just trying to somehow survive and not take myself out of the game and believe in something bigger than me, bigger than anything that could guide me and help me to be a better person for others. And so, I, you know, like you said, it can happen from any age at any time. And, you know, I even was bullied in this. I had a sales job for a while and I was kind of bullied in that little arena with people in the office, you know, kind of looking up to, up and down. Like, what are you wearing? Are your nails done? Is your hair done? I mean, seriously, I know that sounds crazy, but it, no, it, it happens. happens. No, it happens all the just time. Like, okay, is her hair done? Is her hair, you know, and it, it just reminded me of just more of the same, moving from a new town to another job, to another place, to another city, and then being in the industry of show business. Um, and I'm, like I said, you said it can happen in any, any arena, any line of work, but definitely with show business. I mean, you are uh, not always, but you are judged on your appearance. You're judged on your talent. You're judged on your voice, how you look, if you're on time, I mean, every little tiny thing you do contributes to your reputation. And, and if someone just doesn't like you, they just might not like you. You know what? It's, it's life. And, um, so, I mean, I'm a big advocate for, you know, just being strong and, and just not give it into the petty stuff and forgiveness is a big one. And be, yes, forgiving people. Like I had to forgive my stepdad. Holy crap. I, I lived in fear for 20 plus years. What am I going to do? He says, I'm bad. He says, I'm wrong. He says, I'm a bad person and I deserve punishment. And then I went out into my real life and those things happened because I didn't know any better. I was told that's who I was. But you know what? That's not who I am at all. And I'm finding ways to 
forgive the almost the unforgivable what I say that but it you know it takes a big heart and a lot of life experience to get to that point and so I would just encourage people to seek help absolutely whether it be for a substance or you know mental illness or if you need some you know help or some therapy counseling don't be ashamed of this stuff no you know? I, I've been in it for eight months it's very helpful Yes, you too, right? You said you went through that too. You've lost both of your parents. I mean, you you know, you need some help. Well, go seek that help and don't be ashamed of it. And that's what happened for me because I was told so many years, all my life from age six years old, you are, should be ashamed of yourself, you know? Well, you know what? No, I'm not ashamed anymore. This is, this is, I'm a human being, you know, I'm in show business and that's great. And I love my career and I love my fans, but you know, I'm not perfect. I've made some mistakes and I'm, learning from them and hopefully being a good influence on those around me. And if I can help somebody, well, one person, if I can get, keep one person from giving up or taking their life or whatever. And then when I hear these fans come up to me and my table, like, Oh my gosh, I was going through so much. And you got me through so much with this cell saga go on. And you were so strong. And then my heart just explodes when I hear that, when I hear those kind of stories. Right. I mean, because, I was going to ask you about that. How do you feel about voicing such a, uh, an inspirational character, both of them, because the story of Goku and Gohan is the, the story of, you know, overcoming obstacles. That's Dragon Ball in a whole. They overcome, they get challenged, they overcome, they get challenged, and finding who you are on the inside. Goku saw more in Gohan than even Gohan did. Does that remind you of your mom? Does that remind you of, like, people in your life? It sure does. The timing of it is crazy, and to be cast as that role, and <clears throat> excuse me, you know, being the Gohan that sat back behind the rock watching other things happen around and not knowing when, how, if you can respond or react to what's going on. And for for this Gohan character to finally be like, you know what? Okay, now's the time. It's like a fruition. And that's kind of how I feel like I'm like I am this year for whatever reason. And then being like, okay, you know what? I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of being picked on. I'm tired of my friends being picked on. I'm tired of my dad being picked on and, and holding back for so long, so many years is just not having this confidence, you know, it's just, where am I? Who am I? And then him being like, you know what? I am who I am and I'm going to do this. And I've got my, so his father's in his head, right? So that's like my mom, this guardian angel or whatever it is. It's like, you know what? You can do this and you can be strong and you can combat this pain, suffering, grief, loss, bullying, whatever you've been through. It's time to like put that arm up, even though you're injured and you're battered and you're, you're lost and you don't know what to do, but you're like something get there's that spark that gets you. And it's like, you know what? I can do this and I'm going to do this and I'm done. I've had it like in a good way. Like, not in a defiant way. That's meanwhile. Gohan like, to a T right there. I'm done. Right? I've had it, right? <laughs> that's why I told you I can really relate to him a lot. I mean, as much as I love Goku for the comedic stuff and the slapstick, but that Gohan thing, that runs that runs deep with me personally throughout. It's like a complete reflection of what I've been through as a, as a, as a human being <laughs> on Earth, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, that's the best note we could possibly end on. I was going to ask you about OK KO, but we can save yeah. that for the future. Um, yeah, OK. So where can people find you at? I know you're doing the convention loop, but unfortunately, because of the pandemic, that's not going to be a thing as much as it was before. But uh, is there a place uh, on the Internet that you hang out? Do you have an Instagram? I'm just curious about what. Yeah. Promote whatever you want to right now. Yo, you've got the floor. I love that. Yo, <laughs> yo, you got the floor. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I have a um, fan club email that is Stephanie fan mail. At e I'm sorry. Stephanie fan mail at gmail.com. Such as Stephanie S T E P H A N I E F A N M A I L at gmail.com. That's my, that's my, um, fan mail. You can, um, request autographs that way. We can do that through the mail. I'm going to be involved with con live with, uh, Chris Latosh. Avail that'll be let's see when are we doing that? I think we're doing that in January. January is supposed to be. No, 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 I'm green. sorry. This no, this is important. December twenty seventh, it's a Sunday. We're there we're oh, gonna be even sooner. Yes. We're gonna be selling, I guess, spots for some hangout times. 
we're going to do two, five, ten, possibly as late at, or as many as 30 minutes. And then we can like just totally hang out. And then if you want something signed, I'll sign it and mail it out. Um, I'm also involved with Jose Mega Man. He's on Facebook. I do yeah. have an Instagram that I'm still working on. Like I said, I'm <laughs> a little slow with technology, but I'm working on it. And that's just Stephanie and it only. Um, I'm also doing some um, narrations for Wonderbot Animals on YouTube. That's Wonderbot Animals, W-O-N-D-E-R-B-O-T, Animals. You can sign, subscribe, check that out. I'm one of three narrators for that. I did do some work with the Adventures of Ryan DeFrades. Those are available on DVD online. We put that to a stop this year because of the pandemic. I'm going to pick back up on that hopefully next year. And then I'm just doing some off and on um, virtual slash in-person conventions. I know next week um, is going to be, oh gosh, there's a comic store in Watauga, which is north of Fort Worth. I'll be doing that December 12th from about 11 to 6. And then um, next March, I'll be in Midland for the Permian Basin Con there. Kamea Con 3 is supposed to happen, hopefully, if all goes well. It depends on what Texas says. I've heard, yeah. With social distancing, we'll have to just see. But as of now, it's going to be in Allen, Texas, the second weekend of January. That's north, far north Dallas, January 15th weekend. And yeah, I'm just involved with just different stuff like that. So I'm kind of like creeping back and like, you know, hey, here I am again. And hopefully there'll be some more opportunities with some other companies to do some stuff, get involved with maybe an agent that can really help work me a little more than I'm working now. And yeah, just being a good influence on on my peeps and my fans and <laughs> certainly love my geeks. My anime fans are the freaking best. I love them. Yes. I mean, they... Yeah, they are definitely dedicated to you for sure. And I look, I, it was a pleasure talking to you. There's, I have a lot more to ask you, but we can probably do that in the future because I know you're, you got Chinese food with lots of soy sauce there waiting for yeah, you. I, I know. Asian food, right? Love I, it. I, dude, I have sushi. I mean, I try to have it at least once a uh, week. I can't now, but it's it's my favorite okay. for sure. But uh, thank. Yeah, I love this. I love this. Thank you so much for having me. No, thank you so much for talking to me. And uh, remember to check out Stephanie. Uh, you be around. I mean, we'll, if there's a big con coming up, let me know and I'll throw a promo out for you. And I'll say, Hey, if you want to meet Stephanie, yeah. like, you know, next year, whenever they come back or the year after, hopefully next year. Um, cause I'm sure you'll get booked at more and more conventions as they start opening up. It's just, you know how it is. Yeah. We're all, cause yeah. I was going to do some stuff too. And I can't. So, right. Well, we'll do that when we can. We'll take it one step at a time. But I just, my main message is just to like, be strong and don't let people get you down and just believe in yourself and have confidence and know that you're, you've got, a, a purpose here. We're, we're not just people just wandering around like pinballs slamming into stuff. We are here for a reason and we meet people for a reason. We have, hopefully I'm having a good inf effect on people. Um, certainly didn't choose this life the way it went, but at the same time, I'm very grateful for the opportunities I've had and that I hope to help more people. And hopefully my career will start to kind of come back. It's, it's definitely doing so now. So I'm grateful for that. And if I can do good things, that's I'm all for it. Yes, and if you're going through something, you think you've hit rock bottom. There's always a way out. That's the message yeah. here. Yeah. And I and I'm different. I'm not like most others. I, I well, I say that I don't know, but I have a fan club email, and I will answer each and every email personally. I I do not ask for money for that. This is not. That's not what it's about. It helps me to help others because now I know that's my purpose. You and said Stephanie fan mail at gmail .com? StephanieFanMail at gmail.com. Okay. Yes. If you want to contact Stephanie right there, just do it. You know? Yeah. And then the Wonder Bot Animals on YouTube. And then you could look up uh, Wikipedia, IMDb, Stephanie and Dolly, Windstar, Stephanie and Dolly. There's all kinds of stuff on YouTube people are posting. I've also got a lot of really cool original music that, uh, that I did back with Brave Combo, Carl Finch. Who we worked on the animation themes I talked about. Yeah. We have a, a whole album called The Cookies, and we put it out in 1998, 1987, 98. I'm going to hopefully get that up on Spotify yes. or YouTube so that, I mean, it's some really amazing stuff with like some basic Casio kind of sounding, really, in, really interesting music that never got released, and we want to put it out there because it's super cool. And I hope to do some songwriting and maybe even put out an album. That's one of the things I want to do on my bucket list. So you, you, I think that'll happen too. You can do it, yo. I mean, now you got a microphone right. at home. People record albums at home now. You you can do it. I mean, that's like a pretty good yeah. mic right there. My best friend in the world, Dan Bradford, he's my bass player. We, you know, he, we, I just bought this really cool, awesome keyboard. We're going to learn how to use it. And I'm, I want to go back to my piano lesson riffs and like get sit back down and kind of like, I dirt like if 
I definitely have some stuff to write about, right? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, you do. You got stories. <laughs> like life stories that hopefully can do nothing but be positive influence on influences. Influ you know what I mean? Influ I'm getting tired. Yeah, I know. A good it's late. influence on all of those around me, whether or not they're fans of my work or not. And it was an honor to have you at my birthday party last year. That oh, was cool. Oh, that's right. The Co <laughs> Korean barbecue is so delicious. I mean, oh, it was mm. so good. I miss yeah. it. That's one thing I miss. Right. Well, yeah. you reach out anytime you want. We'll do this again. Yeah. Okay, I would... we'll catch up and see what everything's, you know, maybe we can do a question and answer thing and. You know, yeah. sign, whatever. Next year, if you're open or whatever, or, or, you know, maybe not even that far away, we could have you back on and do like a stream and talk to everybody because the people would want to join in for that and talk to you directly. Well, I would love that. Let's do it. And I think it's really cool too is some of the fans grow up and then they have kids and they watch the show all over again with their kids. Uh, I love it. Yeah. And these... they bring their cute little kids out and I'm just like, oh my God. And they dress up like Goku and Gohan and I'm just like, oh, it makes me melt. I mean, it's just funny because like for me personally, I, I was... This is going to get, you know, just me personally. I was a fat 14-year-old virgin, and I got my hands on that Ginyu Assault tape, which was the first time your voice was heard. And I, <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's just funny because, you know, I would pause on the credits, and they would have the new cast list. And, you know, I didn't know any of these names at the time. And then here I am talking to you, and it's very cool. It's very cool how life is, you know what I mean? I'm not... Right. Yeah, I'm not one of those guys that's, like, starstruck, and I'm, I'm genuinely not, but it's very cool for me to to talk to you, uh, you know, it was so long ago, but yet it feels like yesterday. It's weird. Right. We have a lot more in common than we realized too. We talked for a little bit before the interview and I really, I'm really glad we were able to have that time to kind of like set the stage for this whole thing, you know? Yes. I appreciate it. I want to talk to you more command come, but yeah. oh, there was too much going on. I was, we were way too busy. You know how it is. Yeah. But in a good way. And we could definitely, that's why we have the internet and we can definitely do this again. You reach out anytime. Thank you. This out. Thank you so much for working with my schedule, too. You no, know, it's fine. Thank you for doing it. And thanks, everybody, for listening. We will catch you Yay. next time.